So if pastors were honest about it, Zechariah is one of the stories in Scripture that really makes us uneasy, because he's one of our own, a priest serving God in God's house. And if you remember back to your readings in Exodus, priests functioned in the temple in a particular way. Only one priest would go in to make the offering, because possible encounters with the divine were not to be taken lightly. So only trained professional priests did this, and they had to draw straws for who had to go in. Do not try this at home might be the sign on the wall. They would tie a rope around the waist of the priest who went in to make the offering so that they could pull his body out if he did not survive an encounter with God. So if there is any place that Zechariah might have expected to meet a divine messenger, Perhaps this would have been it. But he walks into the place where God lives with a rope tied around his waist and the divine messenger walks in the door and speaks to him and he's like, and I'm sorry, who are you? (laughs) Now, if Zechariah had encountered the angel like in the produce section at Molly Stone's or at a Warriors game or something, we might have forgiven him because... Life is busy and it's easy to be distracted when your regular life is going on around you. But he's in the temple. That's why we pastors get a little uneasy about this text. We spend a lot of time here in this building, I'll tell you. We listen for God, except of course for the time when the divine speaks to us clearly and we miss it all together. The angel gives Zechariah the usual angel stuff. Do not be afraid, yada, yada, yada and also some very specific instructions. Your prayer has been heard, your wife will bear a son, his name will be John. And Zechariah, even in the midst of that divine presence, can't put aside those human details and questions we want to ask, just like Sarah and Abraham had done before him, and just like we have done perhaps after him. Zechariah allows human details and limitations to question God's movement in the world. How am I going to know this is so? I'm an old man, and my wife is getting on in years, which is something you should never say about your wife. I'll just tell you that right now. (laughs) The do not be afraid message ends when Zechariah asks for proof. You can almost hear it in the reply, can't you? My name is Gabriel. I am God's chief of staff, and God sent me to you, even though I have a lot of actual very important work to do already. I'm not sure why God didn't send a lesser member of the heavenly host if you're going to be so quarrelsome about this good news, Zechariah. Be very afraid. (laughs) Zechariah does not die in his encounter with the divine, but he loses his voice for nine months, which is also something preachers and priests don't want to think about. He will not say another word until after John is born. I suspect that losing your voice for nine months would give you ample time to think about what it is you really want to say. So listen again to what happened after John was born. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. They were going to name him Zechariah after his father. And his mother said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, none of your relatives have this name. They began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue freed and he began to speak, praising God. So Zechariah gets his voice back. He acknowledges his wife was correct, let it be noted, and verifies that this child is to be called John as the angel said, even though everybody else thought he should be Zechariah Jr. So I wonder about that. Why do you think the angel Gabriel gets involved in the naming of children? He tells Mary her baby will be named Jesus. He tells Zechariah his son will be named John. Was he afraid they'd go with Chad and Chad the Baptist didn't sound right? I don't know. I'm, honestly, I have no idea. Many of us pick names for our children because we like the way they sound. Or maybe they are family names. We may or may not know the meaning of the name when we pick it. My name, Marcella, is a very feminine and pretty sounding name, but it's the feminine version of the name of the god of war, Mars. My name means warlike, military, and strong. I'm pretty sure my parents 
didn't know that when they named me. I mean, I don't know how militant and warlike I was as an infant, but it does maybe explain some things. But most names in the Bible are very intentional. They know what they mean. John means God is gracious. Zechariah means God remembers. Jesus means God saves. We need all of those names and all of those reminders. John will grow up to call people to repentance. He is the one who will prepare the way for Jesus. So maybe it's good to have that reminder that God is gracious to go alongside those calls to repentance. And once Zechariah has his voice back, he utters 12 verses of beautiful poetry, and I wonder if he'd been composing it in silence for all those nine months. His voice comes back and bursts forth in praise and hope and promise and thanks. The dawn from on high will break upon us. The Lord we seek will suddenly come to his temple. That's the good news, friends. God will become flesh and will pitch a tent among mortals. That's the good news we're preparing for next Sunday. Jesus' birth, as Zechariah saw it, is God coming to the temple. So Advent is the time of preparation for our celebration of the birth of a baby born 2,000 years ago. That baby, obviously, has already been born, but Advent is more than preparing to remember something that happened long, long ago in a Galilee far, far away. It is preparing to live it again, to be open for God to be born in us, as the hymn says, today. A number of years ago, some people were convinced the world was going to end. Do you remember that? Because of some Mayan calendar. And someone said, I'm not afraid the world will end. I'm afraid it will stay the same. Advent hope is a reverse phrasing of that statement. We hope that the world will change. We have confidence that it will not stay the same. As our O Holy Night Carol says, much like Zechariah's song, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. While we are not the hope of the world, come back next week at 10 a.m., 5 p.m., or 8 p.m. to hear more about him. We are the ones that share that hope and embody that hope for a weary world rejoicing. We show our Advent hope in the work we do for our community partners. To name a few of the ways you've done it recently, last week you sent Christmas cards to the um, incarcerated people through the Ella Baker Center. You bought gifts for Safe House or Raphael House residents. You support our sanctuary families as they celebrate holidays in a new country. You work at the food pantry to be sure our neighbors have enough to eat. Thursday, we will gather before the longest night service for a pack -a sack making sack lunches to give to people who are hungry this season. That's how you show your Advent hope. We show our Advent hope by expecting we will get a visit from God's messenger as Zechariah did. It may or may not be the angel Gabriel, but God may meet us at coffee hour or in a class or in worship or at choir rehearsal or when we help our community partners. Expect a visit from the divine. We show our Advent hope by gathering together and joining our voices in Zechariah's song. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. You shall come to your people and set them free. Amen. May it be so.